Carr Harris was one of the most distinguished and prolific women authors in the early 20th century. In researching Mrs. Harris's life and literary works, I was both impressed and intimidated by the scope and diversity of topics that flowed from her prolific pen. Between 1889 and 1934, her works included 24 books and hundreds of magazine articles. Her most famous novel, A Circuit Rider's Wife, published in 1910, was the basis for a 20th Century Fox motion picture, I've Climbed the Highest Mountain, released shortly after her death. Cora White was born in Elbert County in 1869. She would grow up to marry Lundy Howard Harris, a professor of Greek at Emory College. Soon thereafter, the couple moved to Bartow County. Her journalistic career began as a feature writer with The Independent in 1889. Achieving prominence with an article on the lynching of Negroes, she attracted the attention of editor Hamilton Holt and was soon under contract with the Saturday Evening Post. In 1911, she was sent to Europe by the Post, and in 1914, she became America's first woman war correspondent. As a historian, I would make no pretense to evaluate the finer points of literature. But Cara Harris wrote for common people, and her success on that score was indeed phenomenal. Her secret to literary success was the force of good English used directly, without flowery adjectives, to be honest, to seek the truth of her subject. Even though she wrote in a different time and place, her works will haunt you long after you have left her work. Let us go now to Cass High School, where Professor D.D. D. Yao of Kennesaw State College, an English professor and an expert on the literary works of Cara Harris, is directing a lecture discussion class on the life and works of Cara Harris with an honors class at Cass High. She was born uh, right after the Civil War, 1869, and died in 1935. And as she said, she was coming up as the price of cotton was going down. Her daddy was a planter, three generations of planters. Uh, they did own slaves, uh, but they were like all the other Southerners after the war. They had really very little left. And she was a woman who grew up working hard. She, uh, they lost their house in the, in the war. It was burned with the exception of five chimneys and they lived in the overseer's house. And, and she had her daughter in, in a room there too. So there's a kind of continuity and a connectedness to the earth that I think makes this woman very wonderful. Um, she wrote all total 14 novels and most of them were serialized. Do you know what that means when you serialize a novel? It's, they're published in magazines first. Saturday Evening Post, Harper's, Ladies Home Journal, Country Gentleman, you've read some articles from Country Gentleman. And this was very common in the 19th century and in England and in this country. In fact, William Faulkner serialized too. And she had a very wide reading public. I think what's interesting is to look at her work today and see if it touches us as it did uh, when she wrote. Her book that she wrote called A Circuit Rider's Wife generated such interest that she was receiving mail 25 years later, in fact, kept it stacked in a room in her cabin. Uh, I think it was very important to her that people responded to her books. I don't like to read from notes because um, I figure you could just come up here and read them too, but I do want to tell you something she said because it struck me, not just about her, but about any writer. Why does a writer write? What are they telling us when they write books that speak to our hearts? And she said as a writer that there was, there was one thing that she always counted on, and, and that was that times and civilizations and people's beliefs are going to change, but that the human heart never changes. And that's the one country that we all inhabit together. Uh, even though she was a woman uh, from a very, in a very different time from ours, I think probably her life experiences were not so different. And uh, the fact that she married young, 18 years old, married her Lancelot. She loved Tennyson's poem, Lady of Shalott, memorized it when she was 16, and married a preacher. Now, like, um, 
life, things don't always turn out like we want them to. And we were talking just a little bit earlier about what her marriage was like. And you promised me that you would talk about that. To begin with, her marriage seemed to be okay. She was a very strong woman, sort of controlled her husband. And as time went on, he began to go out on circuits preaching and going out and he sort of began to drift from his religion as well as from his wife and that began to get to her. He was appointed to a couple of college boards, taught at Emory University, kept, uh, kept him away from her a lot and he at one point in their marriage, after I believe about 12 years, mm -hmm. left her note and ran away for two weeks. When he finally returned, he wasn't exactly all there, so to speak. He mm -hmm. had basically gone senile, gone a little crazy, and attempted suicide six times, and on the seventh attempt, he succeeded. Let me introduce Bill Raines and Betty Raines Upshaw. Bill and Betty are brother and sister, and both came to live with Cara Harris when they were quite young. Could you tell us, share a little bit about um, uh, what type of person Lundy Harris was or anything about their marriage that, that you think would be of interest to, um, to people interested in Carr Harrison? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Lundy, Carr Harris said that she was as much uh, um, Lundy's child mentally as she was her parents' child physically. Physically. And uh, uh, she she was not well educated. Carl Harris had gone to school, uh, never to college, uh, but she stayed with, went to uh, uh, stay with her uncle, and um, and to and he was a teacher, and uh, uh, Lundy, he was Lundy's best friend, and so that's where she met him. Oh, okay. As and he student. was a good bit older than Carl Harris, mm -hmm. and. Um, he, he told her, though, then, he said, now, I'm going to marry you when you grow up. And she said she believed it, you know. And so uh, they, they did marry. But I think, uh, I don't know, but I'm almost sure that, that London did not pursue it as much as Carter Harris would, would have liked him to. But... Uh, and she may have made some advances to him then, you know, that, that uh, ladylike, like they don't like, like you do now. And, and mm -hmm. because she, she knew, she, he, he said he was going to marry her, you know, and that, and, uh, um, but everybody loved Blondie that I've ever met. Some of, of, of the people that he, he, he that uh, had gone to his church. And uh, um, and his doctor, I knew him that that uh, uh, later on in life, and he said he's one of the most attractive men that uh, that uh, that he, he he had ever known. But uh, that he had that he had the desire to be punished, be uh, the, because uh, uh, he. He, I, th I think he felt that if he was not being punished, he was not, he, he was, he was not doing the real job. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's, uh, I, I've read that he, that he was like a self-destructive type yeah, personality. Uh, yeah. uh -huh. mm -hmm. And uh, uh, would really, uh, uh, whenever they, uh, he got a good church and he got it going good, but that would be too much for him. He would, he would uh, either. Uh, leave for a while or he would uh, one of the things that he did was to get, get up and, and uh, 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 confess to things that he had not done and they had followed him up and he had not done them but oh. he said he would so he would lose his, his, his position his his that, that is strange to, uh, to openly confess something that you yeah, haven't done. Um, that, that's, yeah. that's interesting. And, uh, um, but guys, wherever he went, or whatever, if, if they uh, 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 lost all they had and everything, she was, 
she was right with him, you know. And and were, I, were they ever reduced to poverty? Yes, they were. They um, um, uh, when he he left it at uh, when they were down in Oxford. Um, when he came back, Carhis went back down there and sold everything they had, and they lived uh, for a while with uh, uh, her sister. Her sister married Lundy's brother, and he was also a Christian. Oh, okay. And uh, uh, they lived for a year with, with them. And then he got a little job teaching up at uh, uh, one of the small colleges in North Georgia, uh -huh. Young Harris. A woman in the, at that time with no support, what is she going to do to make a living? Uh, she said, you know, it's funny that, that women get praised for their cookies that they bake, but not the poems they write. However, she was able to write books that were popular enough that they made her a very good living. The first thing Carhage did really was to, to make money was uh, to, uh, she wrote a, a little note to uh, the Independent, uh, and it was a little magazine. And uh, um, uh, and they asked her to write some more, but and um, so she uh, got the job of, of reviewing books, and uh, Doctor, uh, uh, gosh, I forgot, can't think of his name, mm -hmm. but okay. um, but um, um, he lived to review books, and he said that she that she reviewed 500 books when you read them and reviewed them. That's incredible that she yeah. read and reviewed yeah, 500 but books. She would, mm -hmm. she would do anything then, and then to keep it, uh, faith in school, and and uh, I suppose, uh, but um, uh, one month later. Uh, she was in Florida for a few, few months, and uh, um, uh, uh, Lamb in His Bosom was published, and um, she, they, uh, they wanted her, she was writing for the uh, journal then, and they wanted her to write a uh, uh, you know, comment about it, and she wrote it, and she was having such a good time down there, she didn't read the book, and um, she sent it up to me to be typed. And uh, uh, she had had the ending, it wasn't like it was in the book. And um, so I took, cut that out because she was always, she's always too long anyway. And uh, um, so uh, I told, wrote to her and told her, I said, I had to cut that out because that wasn't the way the book ended. Oh. She said it was the way the order ended. <laughs> What about some of the articles that, that we've all read together to prepare for this? You read one that, that I hadn't looked at, The Weaning of Boys. Tell us about that. Well, The Weaning of Boys, she talks about how dependent that young, young kids are on their, on their mother, like especially young boys. And I thought it was funny how, how she punishes her, her kids or teaches them a lesson by feeding them castor oil when they act like they're sick. So they... <laughs> So they don't work. Well, they act like they're sick, so they'll get out of work for the day, and then she feeds them castor oil, so next time they're ready to work. <laughs> yeah, that works. I remember my mother telling me about her grandmother, her mother doing that, my grandmother. Do you think there's a modern analog to that? No. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> but you like that article. It was good because it, it showed it was pretty true to life, how young boys act and how dependent they are on their mothers compared to how girls are. And it's, that's a wonderful contrast with the article that we all read about the Rains girls, right? What was, your, what was your impression about that, about that particular article? What did she say about those, those um, two girls? Anybody? They just came trailing up there like something out of a storybook, didn't they? Mm -hmm. And in effect, ended up staying with her. When her daughter Faith died in 1919, that was, that was a very, very heartbreaking time for her. That Faith was her companion. But the Rains girls were there. She, had, it's, she almost raised them, didn't she? I mean, when they came into her life, it was right after the flu had 
that, that flu that was sweeping the country um, around 1918 or so. I started here, coming up here with my brother-in-law to haul, haul for Carl Harris, and uh, then uh, I don't know if she seen that I wasn't doing nothing but running around, and she asked me about pulling weeds, and I started pulling weeds around the place, and I don't know whether I made an impression or she seen that I love the money so that she gave me for doing it that uh, she wanted to keep doing it and I kept doing that till it just worked on up and up till uh, I was in and she had told me several times as we grow as I was growing up that she'd be uh, that she wanted me to drive sometime far and I would and so she started to, when I was uh, old enough to drive, well, she sent me to Carswell, and I stayed in the garage down there, uh, had its garage for, for a few weeks, and learned to change tires and drive a car and everything, and then I come back on, to the farm and started driving for her. Well, what time period are we talking about here, Mr. Ames? Well, I started off at a, about seven year old, and I started driving when I was 16. So this would have been um, 1920s? Yes. Uh-huh. That's, that's, that's right interesting. Uh, Ms. Upshaw, how did you end up here at, um, uh, now you lived with Carr Harris for several years, as I understand it. Yes, first, uh, uh, Carr Harris' sister, Hope. Uh, they found her dead in bed up here, and Carl Harris had a lot of uh, uh, work to do, and she was going to have company, and, and uh, Hope was over spending the time with her to look at, to really be <clears throat> hostess bar mm -hmm. in the house, and because she had, she'd come up here to work. Now, this was called the pot, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, and it had a little rainbow path down there. So um, uh, she'd come up here and work half a day and then take the other time off, see, and uh, with her guest. And so uh, when, when after Hope died, then um, Carl Harris came down and asked my mother. Now, we had been working for her before. There's Port 11 windows about that big that has to be washed, you know. And they have to be washed, and they have to be washed because they have pines and they have all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we had washed windows and and, and old anything that just happened to come along, you know. And um, uh, I think we got into it first. My sister and me, we we uh, she liked flowers, and we found out that that she liked trailing on beauties, and that was on her, her birthday, the seventeenth of March. So we'd bring her stuff. So she asked uh, my mother to let one of us come up and stay uh, a week. And so I stayed 18 years. Yeah, you stayed yeah. for eight? You, eight, eight? you were invited eight. for a week and stayed 18 years. Yeah, and then uh, the old, old um, colored woman she had cooking uh, uh, just played out. And so my sister then came and cooked. And she said, uh, she said she told us enough. Do you want to be an artist, or would you want to be just a cook? If you're not, a, uh, you want to be an artist. You can cook whatever you want to, and you can uh, have the uh, uh, say so about what's cooked and how it's cooked and so on. What's supposed to do? Now, while you were growing up, and and what was uh, Mr. Rains here, kind of wilds the march here, and keeping the roads hot with Car Harris's car? Or? Well, I think... Uh, did um, she have him under control as I the think he, he probably did sometimes. I mean, she didn't... I don't think that she knew, knew too much about it, but... <laughs> <laughs> but Do you want to say anything about that? And I didn't that? know it either. If I'd, I'd have told it if I had, you know. Yeah, <laughs> You'd have yeah, told all yeah, of it, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, I'd, if I'd known it, 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 it I found out later that it did, but... Yeah. You had a sister who lived here with you all those years, too. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Mr. Range, you lived here. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, we had, uh, uh, first, she built me before my sister came. Uh, she, she, she's two years younger than I am. And, uh, um, and she built me that little room 
uh, it's, uh, it's single, but it's, but, it's, uh, but it's just a single bed. She, bought, she built that for me and, uh, and, and her bathroom upstairs. Mm -hmm. And then when my sister came, we switched over to the bigger room where there's double bed for a while. And then she um, uh, built that house for us over there. She went off one, one, one winter and uh, she fixed the house. It was, it was there, but she changed it over and, and built it into a, a real house, and that was ours. Oh, okay. So and you had your own separate house on the grounds here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, I see. Yeah. And uh, we've been with her everywhere. And, and, uh, uh, my sister, I expect, uh, kept her alive for a long time. She had a, a, a real uh, um, bad heart condition, her heart, mm -hmm. and uh, her sister and her mother died of heart attacks. Mm -hmm. But those two girls that came up to her house kind of moved in, and, and do you remember what she said about teaching children, don't tell them what to do, don't, don't direct anybody, a fool can take orders. Do you remember the little task she gave them? One of them, I think it was Betty. She had to rearrange the, had to rearrange the furniture in the room. Yes, to look like so, like, like. so when a stranger came in, they would feel comfortable. Yes. It's the heart of a good man. Right, to look like the heart of a good man, to be very welcoming. What did she say that that child did with that furniture? Stuck it all up in one corner, didn't she? And in later years, they had um, the two girls had a had a cabin that they lived in. And she, and this is the writer artist. This is the kind of thing a writer artist will do. She said, "I just couldn't keep them in the cabin with me. They were just moving that furniture around all the time." So they were they were very good companions to her. Well, I wanted to ask um, Mr. Raines about some of his experiences as the 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 key chauffeur and the, and the driver for um, Car Harris. Where, where did you take her? Well, we take, we'd go to Car Harris and we had to go to Atlantis to twice, usually once, to, lots of times twice a week to Atlanta. <clears throat> and then uh, I drove her to Nashville and uh, so uh, I never made very, she never made a long trip. She was done getting she wasn't able to make those mm -hmm. kind of trips in the car. Well, did you have a chauffeur's uniform? Oh, or? no, I never, I never wore a chauffeur's uniform. I, she didn't own it, but she wouldn't have had it yeah, anyway. So. Yeah. Uh -huh. But uh, they, yeah, uh, I had, uh, the one thing they liked about me around here was that uh, if the pump broke down, I knew how to fix it because uh, the ones that uh, she'd have her, uh, before, when she had those Negro chauffeurs, well, uh, they'd have to go in town and get a mechanic to come out and fix it. Mm -hmm. And when I was pulling weeds around here, well, those mechanics would want me to stay with them because they're afraid of the dog. And they was glad to show me all about the Delco mm -hmm. and the pump uh, because they didn't like coming out here because they are too afraid. And so uh, then, uh, in the later, uh, didn't take me but a few years to I knew all the tricks on that pump and Delco, and and if I somebody got mad because I went off the night before or something or another, well, uh, and didn't like it, well, it didn't make much difference after I got learning all doing all those things. Well, mm -hmm. that's pretty important to have around. Good to have around the next morning anyway. Uh, you were indispensable, huh? Yeah. Well, so but you. You and Miss Harris always got along fine, and she never we, fired you or anything, huh? We uh, we had our ups and downs. Uh, no, she. We, we, uh, <laughs> she didn't want to fire anybody. <laughs> but I'd leave when she says too much. Well, I'd I'd walk off. But you always came back, huh? Well, she'd always send for me, and I was uh, glad when she did. <laughs> Carter Harris, was a, in her time, she was one of the most famous literary writers in America. Yes, you can You know, she came out here to write because uh, after Lundy died, uh, 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 and she did not know a soul except one family, and there was no electricity out here. There was no uh, uh, people that she could think of to mm -hmm. hire. That she would, she'd have to hire somebody to do something. And um, 
because she didn't want, she wanted to write. Now, when you want to write that bad, judge some neighbors of mine, some little girls, they were talking about wanting to write and talking about Carter Hayes writing. And I said, well, I know how to write, but I said, it's hard work, you know, and you just have to do it because, uh, uh, but I said, now, when you want to write that bad, well, then you'll write, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ms. Raines, how did local people, you know, uh, to, to have a very famous person suddenly come into a community like this, um, and she came here, what, around 1910, thereabouts? Yeah, her husband died in 1910. She came the next, next year, I think, and bought this place. Oh, okay, 1911, even before the First World War. I mean, you know, this is a very rural, kind of an isolated area, and I wonder how, how local people looked upon her and felt about having this famous personality in the neighborhood. Well, now my mother uh, was always a, a good friend of hers, and she came to my mother's house a lot, and my mother had bad feet, she didn't come up here, but but uh, she would have been glad to see any of them, and she did have some real good friends. And then there's others that, that had a chip on their shoulder, you know, and there was everything that they could find that they could say wrong, they did, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, never gave her the benefit of the doubt, you know. I think she was sort of the oddity around, something glamorous about her. I read that Cora Harris was used to be seen uh, when she'd come into Cartersville, into town to shop with her, with her flu mask on. And in later years, she would come in a limo when the uh, water pressure was low at Pine Log, her cabin, and go into the hotel and take a bath and that kind of thing. I read one article where she, um, uh, during the big flu epidemic, I guess, in 1918, it said that, uh, that she was so terrified of getting the flu that she wore this flu mask while she went shopping around Cartersville. Have you ever heard that story? It was not true. It was not, not, not true. She, she, she wasn't afraid of getting, getting a disease. And I never, uh, it's, it's, you hear so many things, it's mm -hmm. just, just not a word of truth. Well, just, well how, how about this one? I read an article last night that, um, uh, that was written and said, um, it said one of the local people in Cartersville said, well, here comes Miss Cara Harris into the hotel to, to take her bath because we're out of water out in the country. Yeah. Is that one true? Yeah. <laughs> we all went. We all went to, and uh, she. They didn't say that she brought brought us along with her brought to take her a bath. Yeah. Well, they were good friends of us, at the, ours, the uh, people that own the hotel, you know, and they come out here, and they were glad for us to come and have you know a bath, you know. So you may get a hair washed all the time. Yeah. I see. Yeah. I see. You know what people said about Cora Harris when she moved way out, way out here? What's wrong with that woman? She's making enough money she could go live in New York. Now why didn't Cora Harris want to go live in New York? She wanted to come home. She dedicated one of her last books of memoirs to Georgia. She said, I was born here in the red soil. I grew up in it. And I wanted to die here and be buried in it, and she was. And the um, chapel is made from stones in the area from around her home. She came back and built a, a log cabin called Pine Log. Um, it took her two years to get it built, from 1912 to 1914. And that was really in the boonies then. I mean, Cartersville, I think, was 20 miles away, or, or the town. So she was living way out with just a big old dog and, and the Reigns girls to help her out too. I'd like to introduce Len Archer, who is the owner of the Car Harris property here. And Len has done an outstanding job of uh, maintaining <coughs> Car Harris's uh, home, uh, the outbuildings associated with Car Harris's property here. And one thing I like about what you've done, Len, is to invite people such yeah. as the Etowah Valley Historical Society, we had our annual meeting out here in the spring. I notice other groups are welcome to come out here. So Lynn's done a real good job of, sh of sharing the Carr Harris uh, story with, with the public. And now at this point, um, I'd like to identify this building here. This log structure was built by a Cherokee uh, chief pine log, as I understand right. it. And of course, there's a village <coughs> nearby called Pine Log, Georgia. 
And one thing that's uh, interesting to me about this building is that this house was built before there was anything known as Cass or Bartow County. This predates the county itself, this mm. structure does. Lynn, when you look at this old log cabin here, and you're standing here where I am, what you see is that the, on each side of this cabin are several wings off to each side. Uh, what's the story on when Cora Harris lived here? Uh, how, how did this evolve and develop into such a complex out here? Well, Miss Harris came here in 1913, and the cabin's all there was. And through the years, she added on mm -hmm. before 1920 and probably around 1920. Okay. Yeah. And if you look, um, Lynn showed me one thing I think is of interest. If you look right here against the wall with these logs, you see these holes in the logs. And the story goes that um, while the Indians still occupied this site, that those holes would have had poles coming out of them and that the Cherokees would have done their weaving. Uh, weaving blankets. The blankets <clears throat> and that sort of thing on, on the side of the wall here. And thank you for inviting us out, Lynn. You're quite welcome. Thank you. I remember you telling the story, and I'd like you to share that with us about the, the man who tore her yard up with his wagon and sh upset her a little bit. Uh, well, tell us about that. The old man uh, attended some of her land, and he knew that she didn't like for him to bring the wagons around in front of the house. And uh, so uh, they cut up the yard, and uh, he had... Uh, he just comes driving through anyway, <clears throat> and she had company sitting out, and so she just got up and asked him, said, Mr. Tanner, says, fine. You knew that I didn't want people to come through the yard with a wagon, and why did you do that? <clears throat> he said, well, I seen you had company, and I wanted to know who it was up here, and I just drove through. And she told him, says, well, says, the next time, says, you leave your wagon down at the foot of the hill, and you just walk up here, and I'll introduce you to all the people that are here, and be glad to have you. I, I think you told me that um, because she was famous and whatnot, that, that sometimes people would just come up to the edge of the yard and, and look up at the house to see if they could get a look at her. And How did she feel about that? Well, it irritated her real bad and uh, but if they come up and stopped at the house well uh, she welcomed them and talked to them but if they done like that uh, she they she showed them the way back Ask them to leave the property. Ab absolutely mm -hmm. one thing that when when you read the Carl Harris's writings um, she's a very very direct very honest person and she, kind of, she, she had a lot of tragedy in her life. Um, she had three children, and uh, only one approached adulthood. And I think she lost two sons in infancy. And in, um, her daughter was in college when she died, or just out of college? No, no, she had been married several years. Oh, she, really? Yeah, uh -huh. she had lived here. Um, one time, Paris was uh, uh, going to take a uh, year off and do something else, and, and she went to New York and stayed a while in other places. And Faith and her husband came here and tried to farm. And uh, uh, Faith was the daughter. It was the daughter, mm -hmm. yes. And and uh, they they grew pigs, and uh, and her daughter uh, wrote a book, pig of uh, 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 story, uh, pigs is pigs about her experience. Mm -hmm. hmm. was, was Cora Harris, uh, I've read some of her stuff, and she apparently had a great sense of humor. C yes. Can you remember anything uh, that comes to your mind, Mr. Raines, that, uh, that you were personally involved in? Or well, you, I think you remember you telling me something about uh, too many cars going by here in the yeah, middle of the she, night. Well, uh, she had, uh, she's, uh, you, she could hear cars passing at night, and <clears throat> then when the cars went by he, on this road at night, there's something up. We knew that there's, there's always somebody bad, sick, or something, and uh, some bootlegger. And so she suspected being a bootlegger, and one of the neighbors that uh, 
cut wood and brought in, hauled over there. Well, she's always get him in the house to <clears throat> find out something from him, talk to him, and she always found out something from everybody she talked to. Uh, she learned something from them, and whether they knew it or not, most of the time they didn't. And uh, she said to him, says, uh, is there any whiskey around here? Says, I keep hearing cars pass at night. He said, well, says, they used to be several years ago when I moved here, but said, I just sit in and drank her all up. <laughs> and says, they're not around here now. <laughs> and, and so, the man wasn't joking about it. He did drink his part. <laughs> Some of the interesting things about her as a woman of her time is, do you all know that she was the first female foreign war correspondent? Did you read that in that biography in 1918? Yeah. And she, she went abroad. She wrote back um, in, in, with a woman's perspective, a woman's point of view. Some of it was, um, I think, looked looked at, sort of askance, but she traveled around. She wasn't afraid to travel, even though to me she was truly Southern and that she had to come home and, and come back to her roots. She went out to California not too long after her daughter had died in about 1925. Did you read about that, what she said? She went to Universal Studios when she went to California, and she had her picture taken with the Universal Studios elephant, Millie, and they, they took her all around there and showed her everything. And you know what her comment was when she came home? Of course, she later wrote it, wrote about it. She was a writer, so of course she'd write about it. She said, she said it reminded her of a visit she had made one time to an insane asylum, going out to Hollywood. And in the hotel where she was staying, I mean, Hollywood's always had starlets, right? But this, this perspective, this vision, she said, it looked like, looked like all these, these women had had graduated and, and hung around after commencement, you know, face lifted and all of that. So she saw immediately Tinseltown for, for what it was. And, and she made a lot of people mad when she wrote that, that book in 1925, All My Travels or something like that. It was in the last few years of her life that she published eight of her novels. So it sounds to me like she was writing to fulfill herself in, in some way. And that's what writers do, if any of you are writers. And I would imagine you are. There's an interesting article, Black and White. Let's talk about that for a minute. What is, what is she talking about in that essay? That was in, uh, was that Saturday Evening Post to the Country Gentleman, 1930? Post, the Post. The Post, okay. If you know the Saturday Evening Post, had a very wide readership. Um, what, what is your response as a, as a group of, of bright young people in 1993 to that essay? What she said, black and white, she's talking about obviously growing up in the deep south. What is her view as a white woman? What is her view of black people who lived with her were very much a part of her life. How did she see black people? They were ignorant and they ought to be feared. That was, she always felt that a black man's job in life was not to become educated out of a book, it was to become educated in the attitudes of white men to be able to discover what they're going to do next. Yes, and survive. Which is pretty perceptive if you think about it in 1930 that she, and I wonder if being a woman on her own didn't give her that insight in some way to understand how do you survive. You know, some of you are talking about that article she read on politics. How do you survive in a world where you're not necessarily the one in power? You listen and you learn. What I think that article comes across as saying, too, is, is about people in general. What observations does she make about white men, for example? What do they want? And I don't think she makes a great distinction between white men and, and white women. What do all people want? Money, power, right, influence. I think she had a wit that sort of saw through to the heart of things. Something that she said about 
marrying her husband, Lundy Harris, who was a, who was a circuit riding preacher. I mean, who would he be today? Willie Lowman, traveling salesman, okay. She said, uh, well, he was a preacher and he, and she didn't, she, she was not inspired with this reverence for um, a man of the cloth necessarily. I think he was sort of her Lancelot who came up. It wasn't just because she was a preacher, because she had a great grandfather who was a preacher, and I think she knew him from the inside out. But she said, well, here's what he'd had to do. She wrote this in her, you know, in one of her books. She said, <clears throat> Lundy had one advantage. He'd been called to preach to people, to heal people, um, teach them the gospel, visit the sick, the widow, the orphan, comfort the saint, seek and save lost men, baptize infants, bury the dead, and listen to this. This is the sort of core Harris kicker. And to be diligent in taking his church collects collections, which is much more of a job than you can imagine if you've never dealt with the financial side of a Christian congregation. <laughs> so right there you have a woman who knows reality and who knows that it has a financial or an economic underpinning to it. Um, her views about, about girls, her views about weaning boys, about how human beings, I think, grow and develop are, are presaged right there in that comment that she didn't hold illusions about people. Um, the article that the fellow who went to visit her wrote, the, the, the portrait of her, how did he depict her to you? The circuit rider's wife, remember, he's, she's famous, she's written all these books, she's living way out in Pine Log, away from everything, and he goes out there to visit her and spends the night, and he's so entranced by the country, how beautiful it is. What did you think about that essay? Did you feel like he was really telling us what she was like? I didn't need him for some reason. I didn't trust that. He was telling his readers what they wanted your copy. It's a very painted over, lots of words. It talks about how wonderful it is to be out in the country and how wonderful he's, how glad he is to be there. And well, he's a city so boy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's kind of amazing. If he's from the city, he's going out to Pine Log, it's quite a change. Do you know, it's really, it's really in the American tradition. Think about Thoreau, and I think that's where Cor Harris fits in as a Southerner and in this area. When you read her writing, you can see the, the natural beauty around, but her real geographical area is what? The human heart. Mrs. Harris suffered major tragedies in her life with the loss of three children and the suicide of her husband. Having walked through the fire of those ordeals and understanding the depths of human suffering, she wrote about the human condition from a perspective that few of us will ever know. Mrs. Harris was a devout Christian and kept the faith that if you have solid values, you will ultimately prevail. Her works are as relevant today as they were 60 years ago and will make provocative reading as long as man continues to care for his fellow man. You know, Carr Harris is, has been dead for over 50 years, and and you all lived part of your life here. The you lived your youth here at Carr Harris's home, and just with your interaction with her, I, I, I'd be real curious to know what type of an impact Carr Harris has had on your life, and you've had a 50 years to reflect on that. Um, uh, what would you say to that, Mr. Raines? And, well, I think that uh, I still remember a lot of things that uh, that she said and uh, that uh, advice that she gave me. For instance, she told me, said, said, always put your money in land. Says, regardless of what kind of land. Said, put your money in land. Said, land will be good forever as long as there's time. And I remember that as one of the main things that, and I've tried to, uh, I've, I've seen that it, it did pay off. Well, how, how much land did you, did, did you end up buying? Well, uh, at one time I owned 480 acres of land. Uh, so that was good advice you gave you, to say the least. It's, it's, it's helped me. And Ms. Upshaw, what, what would come to your mind in terms of uh, the impact that... Well, 
Carter Harris. Had. I think of all the people I've ever known, Carter Harris was was the most real, honest. Uh, to, uh, uh, for instance, I remember uh, she found out when we, we had bought something in town, and and uh, she when we got when we got back out the car, she found out that she that the clerk had, had shortchanged herself, you know, really, and so we went back to do that, you know. She we had to we had to do that. But what I did about myself, of course, I, I, my, nobody was more honorable or honest than my mother, but, but uh, I think uh, uh, I, I should see a different place in, in the world that I probably would have missed. And of course, the uh, association with a lot of famous people that I wouldn't have known. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's uh, 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 she always could look and see something a little brighter somewhere. She and could what? See things a little brighter outside. Oh, okay. She had, she had a, a and <clears throat> she was really not, uh, we never thought she was quite as old as she was, you know. Of course, she was 65, which is young for me now, you know. But, uh, uh, um, she, she was. She was, If you wanted help, uh, well, she she give it to you in any way that you wanted, mm -hmm. you know. And and uh, she said uh, she's always she uh, 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 didn't like buying clothes for herself, but um, she loved buying my sister to make clothes. You know, she just loved. I think we took the place of her her daughter more because you know we were and. But uh, 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 no mother could have been more thoughtful or anything of, of, her, of her own daughters than she was of us. It has been said that a prophet is never without honor except in her own hometown. With Carla Harris, Bartow County was home to a lady who 60 years ago was considered one of Georgia's 10 most famous women. Today, her 24 books are no longer read, and hundreds of her articles gather dust. She is just a name and all but forgotten. Her books and select articles are available in the Bartow County Library in Cartersville for the general public. The Etowah Valley Historical Society is in hopes that this program will renew interest in Bartow's most famous literary person. We hope you have enjoyed this edition of Crossroads. We would like to hear your comments, suggestions, and questions on this subject. Please write the Etowah Valley Historical Society at Post Office Box 1886, Cartersville, Georgia, 30120.